television shows such as the Wendy Williams show. I'd like to talk today about in May of this year, 2011, we were featured on Forbes Life magazine, which is a lifestyle magazine. We were featured one of our custom fedoras, as you can see right here, was featured along with Louis Vuitton, Hermes, and many other luxury brands. At the same time that this story ran, we were also served with a martial order of eviction. And this is what we're going to talk about today, how the scandal needs to stay in business, needs to stay alive, not only to preserve many, many jobs, my own included, but also the character and style and flavor of the East Village. So now we're going to be listening to Wendy Barrett, who is the owner of Village Scandal, and she's going to explain to us what exactly transpired to make a martial eviction? Wendy, how are you? Hi, Paul. It's lovely to see you as always. Yeah, I, you have some kind of stressful news. Can you explain to oh, us how it's stressful? Well, it goes back seven years when a management firm called A.J. Clark took over management of this building. I had been in business the better part of ten years at that time. And uh, suddenly on September 11th, 2004, I was served with an eviction notice by a process server. He didn't serve me. There were a couple of young in interns up front, and he served them, wrote down their descriptions, race, age, etc., said you've been served, and left. Uh, interns must keep a log of everything that they do. They included that for their uh, paperwork. Anyway, and I lost the internship program with the local design colleges uh, over this. In any case, I received this, this eviction for an amount of, uh, at that time I believe it was around $16,000, which was real estate tax escalators. Um, I, since then, been served with an eviction every month since 2004. I've since then, between 2004 and 2007, I uh, paid four times what my share of the tax escalators would have been. Out of fear, I was running up to A.J. Clark, the building manager, whose name is Steve Kaplan, and uh, he would tell me every month, we're going to withdraw this, a legal action, I'm going to give you credit for what you paid, just pay X amount more, and I'll take it away forever. This went on and on and on. After five years, I brought my cousin into the negotiations with Steve Kaplan. I was still served every month. You're served twice a month by a process server with an open petition, which means my customers saw it, my employees. They were such huge amounts, such as this year I've been served with $97,000 a month. It looks as though I've never paid rent. I lose my authority. I've won many business awards. I was 
at the President's Dinner in Washington, D.C. in 2006 on the 19th of um, June 2006, where I won a business award. I was in eviction status then for taxes I had overpaid. And you I, knew you overpaid them, right? Yes. So you were confident. I, I, I've made every effort by letter, personal visits, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. I'm always promised they'll, they'll be taken care of, uh, and they are never taken care of. In short, I'm going to go into more detail as it's a very interesting way to get rid of people. I found that in the petition I asked people to sign, my customers over the last few days, they were broken hearted. It's their favorite store in the world. I have all this. But over 70% of these petition signers have problems with their landlords, both residential and commercial. And this is a common story. It should be a rare story. Management firms must act ethically. There are ways to evict people if it's your turn. And they like to get the apartments, the controlled and stabilized apartments, the tenants out to raise the rent roll. Well, when the landlords purchase these buildings, one of the first things mentioned after the price is the rent roll. So if you don't like your rent roll, don't stoop to illegal means to get people out if you don't like the rent roll. Count on that money. Of course, eventually people move on, people die, naturally, but the tactics used in all the stories I've heard are heartbreaking, and they're all illegal. They're not the normal court-sanctioned processes. My commercial tenants, of course, we don't have many much protection under our leases, but you cannot bill somebody and take somebody into court for something they've paid for seven years. I'm not just taking in, let's say you break up the taxes over a year into 12. I am taken into court and sued every month, for instance this past year, for $97,000, uh, $1.5 million. I have been served with over $8.7 million worth of taxes due over the last seven years. It is the accumulated amount from 2004 to whatever date it is, every month. And the reason they have to keep signing petitions just about every month, sometimes they'll wait two months, they'll, they'll send my rent back as part of it, saying we can't accept your rent because you're an illegal actor, we can't accept your rent when you really owe 80 or 90,000, we can't accept a month's rent, and then that becomes part of it too, it adds up. It looks like I didn't pay the rent, unpaid rent too. Right. But um, Makes you look like a deadbeat. That's the, the purpose. But they've taken a good tenant. I mean, the amount of... I changed the neighborhood completely, for which I'll be showing letters from block presidents and other landlords and businesses in the neighborhood, including famous McSorley's Ale House. Um, I completely changed the block and took a chance on this space 16 years ago. And it is uh, a... It's a first that I've heard this particular form of eviction. The way I lost the, the way it got to eviction status, of course, I never looked for another space. A, the landlord had my rent Because you were convinced you were all paid. I, I have receipts of all my payments. So I knew once I finally got to court, the court, the trial was, to, after seven years, was to begin on May 4th, 2011. My lawyer and I showed up on May 4th, 2011. I was most excited, and I knew for the first time I'd get to speak. Everybody kept saying, tell the judge this, tell the judge that. You don't speak until you go to trial. What the court tells you to do is make a settlement with the opposing party, and then the court sanctions that. Well, every time A.J. Clark offered a settlement, they never followed through. So it got to the point where we had to go to trial. This is after seven years for the first time I would be able Excuse to Excuse me, you mean they would it. offer and you would accept? No, the way the way the tenant landlord court works is it's done by settlement. There are very few trials in either the commercial or residential. <laughs> because I had a trial, but that's another well, okay. story. You, you had a trial. You were the rare our, ones. I, I paid dearly for the lessons the, I learned. Yes, <laughs> and you've learned a lot, Paula. Yes. You're an expert now. Yeah, well, I'm not an expert, but, but I learned I a lot. I think you are. But it, it's like anyway. Joe, my husband said, is when they when they throw a few punches in a certain direction, you learn those punches and you learn how to block them the next time. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> 
In any case, 99% of the tenant landlord actions, both commercial and residential, are done by settlement. The landlord sues you for X amount. And then, you know, they come back and there's an offer, particularly in residential, if you're able to pay it off and there's a lower amount settled upon and it becomes court ordered and then you have to pay that amount. The court sanctions it. You generally don't go to trial. In this case, after seven years of not being able to do a settlement, which I was promised every month would be done, uh, I was finally going to get my chance to speak on May 11th. And what Your happened? Day in court. My day in court at last, I had all my cashier's checks, all of my information. And we were going to question the, the uh, I had them follow through the A.J. Clark bank account. They showed that not only had I paid the taxes in full, but I paid in excess of what the taxes were. Uh, and my lawyer said, we're not on the calendar. And I said, what? So he said, let me find out. So it took him quite a while, maybe two hours, maybe an hour. Um, and he found out that there had been a default judgment against me on April 26, 2011. Now, the court date, the last court date we had had before May 4th, I should say, that was set in the end of March, was for the trial May 4th. There was no other court date. That was the next court date. But the other side had filed a motion. My lawyer said he was never notified. Um, it, they, they served him at an address that he hadn't used in five months, and it's a UPS mailbox service. This is an address on 2nd Avenue in the 80s that is a huge apartment building and has about nine stores underneath it. And the address on the service was just that address. If it didn't have box number, they would have no no way to serve it. And, appar and apparently it was not served. He never received it. And the owner of the UPS center said if anything had come from him, it would have been rejected because he no longer had the box there. So he never had service of this motion, which if he had appeared on April 26, we could have won. I could have defended myself. This is another story what this motion was about, which was also a clear violation of my rights. But in any case, that's up for the court, for the court to decide. Um, so that is what enabled them to get the marshal's eviction. I have never once uttered a word in my defense in court. I have never once been able to show my canceled cashier's checks because I lost by default judgment simply because my lawyer didn't appear. My lawyer tried to appear, uh, appeal that, and the judge didn't buy it. She said it was up to him to follow online anyway, and she let the default judgment stand against me. Uh, it's so really sad. I, won on a I, I lost on a technicality, and of course they immediately applied for Marshall's eviction. Now, normally, even though Marshall's evictions are a very ugly thing, and I think should be done away with altogether, um, I think there's always room for negotiation or people can leave voluntarily. I mean, if there's some kind of criminal action going on, you know, that's another thing. But in any right. case, Marshall's evictions are used primarily in restaurants less than a year old that never pay their rent, that are troublesome tenants from all viewpoints. You know, right. you don't trust that they're I have to transform this building. I continue to pour my own money into this building, which I don't have to do. I built those garbage outside twice. We paint them once a month. I paint the trim of the building. We removed all the tenants' garbage over the winter by my own private carting service. I take packages daily. We leave keys off. We talk to the parents of the students who rent here. Uh, I put in all the lighting on the exterior. I completely changed the exterior of this building when I took over 16 years ago, when I opened it, it wasn't even it had been closed. There were cinder blocks in front, there were needles, there were condoms. It was not the wow. East Village we know now. Uh, it was a chancy address, and I continue every day. I love the building, I love the location, and every day I go above and beyond the call of duty, and so do my employees. We scrub the garbage containers every day, top sides and fronts and trim which I have every employee do. I'm paying them to do it. 
this is for the building. I can't even use the garbage containers I build and maintain. Um, I have sheet metal workers come over when they something happens. Anyway, it's an act of love and care. You do not evict. Well, a, privately run businesses always are more loving and caring. Oh, of course. And they have a, a better business. rapport with yes. your customers. You yes. Know, part of the community. Yes. It's not just about money. You're right, Paula. <laughs> In any case. I was served with the Marshall's eviction on June 10th. Among other things, my blood pressure went sky high. My physician wanted to put me in, hospitalize me. I've gotten double the dose, then triple the dose since then. I immediately uh, got um, community support. I hired a new lawyer who has worked probably two or three hundred hours nonstop. Once you're served a Marshall's eviction, there are very few alternatives you have. You don't have a normal appeal process because the case is over. And when you're served a Marshall's eviction, in effect, your lease is over. Only the court can reinstate it. Yes. How often are leases reinstated by the court? Oh, well, my, uh, they were so happy with me in 2004. I was served with, a, with a, uh, a, a, an eviction notice in 2004 when they took over to get back to it. When I went up to speak to the one of the principals there, Michael Gravo, who's also a lawyer, one of the principals at A.J. Clark, uh, he offered me a new lease, which in 2004 went to 2016. They were so happy with me. And he suggested I offer a $5,000 uh, escrow amount for the future taxes that would be applied to taxes at a future date. The taxes for 2004, my share would have been about $750. They didn't take over management until late August of 2004. That's why I was served the eviction on September 11th, 2004. I might add that on September 11, after September 11th, 2001, I took advantage of the New York State Economic Development Loan for $50,000 so I could stay in business. J.P. Morgan Chase, which offered it, uh, it's called the World Trade Center Disaster Loan Program by the state. This is offered by the New York State Economic Development Corporation. I took out one at J.P. Morgan Chase. I took out one at all the major banks were were, were bound to offer 9/11 disaster loan programs. I took out uh, loans at Bank of America. J.P. Morgan Chase, they were all connected to, to 9-11. As well, I took out a personal loan to pay these taxes. I had the check made out to A.J. Clark taxes. For $10,000, I took a personal loan out. I also borrowed $24,000 from my sister and brother-in-law for the taxes, which I have a affidavit from them, which was for the, t for the A.J. Clark taxes. I have a mortgage on my home, a second mortgage on my home for that. I have overpaid the taxes out of fear of being evicted. I never got my day in court. I didn't get my day in court May 11th. I lost by default judgment. Excuse me, was that housing court May 11th? Yes, housing court, the commercial court, division. 2011. Yes, that was when trial was set. I see. Mm -hmm. And as I say, we got there. I, 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 I have to say, if it had been anybody else, any other case, I might have thought, well, maybe they made a mistake in serving my attorney at that address. Possibly it was by happenstance. But considering it would be the first time I would have proof that every eviction they took me into court on for seven years was not valid. I, 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 I have to say, my cynical nature sh says maybe there was a correlation between some funny business going on. Um, that I lost by default judgment a week before the trial was to begin after seven years. As, as a private woman in business, what do you want New Yorkers to know about this? Well, I this want them to know my story is an example. I can give them hundreds of stories, and particularly in the East Village, of the organic bakery on St. Mark's Place. who was there 30 years. His landlord was pulling not the same tricks, but other things to evict him. There are, I, I could mention the businesses by name, uh, but there are, we're all suffering from this. We need some safeguards for commercial leases. We, if a managing agent does not follow the law, the landlords must be compelled to get another management firm. 
Who's more responsible in the eyes of the court, the management company or the owners of See, the building? See, that's the sad thing. The landlords are more responsible. Really? Because the managing agent acts as the landlord. They become legally the landlord. They sign for the landlord. And in this case, I appeal to Dr. Raymer, Dr. Mark Raymer, who is a dentist. Uh, I mention his name only because he's a gentleman, a kind man, he's in the healing arts. I know he cares for his patients, he has a fine reputation. I know he does not know this is going on. So what you're telling me is that many owners of buildings have management companies that are doing practices yes. that if they knew about, they would be shocked. Yes, including many management firms. Um, don't when, when an owner signs a contract, the management firm says they'll apply for all the certificates and licenses they need and so forth and so on and obey the law. And there are many buildings um, who are under investigation right now for not getting building permits where they completely rehab apartments or do any exterior or interior work, of course. And that's done for the safeguard of people. Now, if a dentist owns the building and as a result of not getting a building permit and as a result of perhaps hiring uh, un unlicensed uh, contractors, and I'm not saying this is necessarily the case at 19 7th Street, but I'm giving an example, which happens every day in the neighborhood. The 19 East 7th is your shop. My address. Yeah. I'm not saying this is happening. Uh, I don't have concrete information right now. But it is happening all over the neighborhood. And in this case, you have a dentist who's licensed by the Department of Education. They put this poor man at risk, wow. you see. And unfortunately, you know, in the old days... Excuse me, when you say they put him at risk, he well, doesn't if realize an the liability he has by having yeah, an agency he did, that's going to back out he, when he it would, gets tough? No, he doesn't know what they're doing, if they're doing that with, with, with the permits. I know he doesn't know that I've been evicted every month since 2004. I know he doesn't know what I've gone through physically and financially and the damage that it's done to me, the neighborhood. I know he doesn't know that, and I know if he did, he would take care of it. All he has to do is withdraw the marshal's eviction, and then I can go into court, have my day in court, show my cashier's checks, and then I'll win. But in general, everyone must check who represents them legally as the landlord. Because management companies are in it to make money. Generally, it's 10% of the total revenues they bring in. They get the cheapest of this, the cheapest of that. You don't see any more love put into the buildings by landlords that want special lighting or perhaps pick tenants because they might go together well and really love the building. You see people that look at it just as a bottom line. What's the cheapest thing we can do? What can we get away with? I, I appeal to A.J. Clark and the principals there, Andrew Clark, Michael Grabo, to honor. I will show the documents I have. Let me prove in a court of law I've paid you the taxes. How do you know that, I mean, uh, this isn't necessarily the case of your dentist landlord, but throughout this city, what do you want landlords to know? I want landlords to take a, a more active interest. I mean, be because they may be told by their management company, of hey, let us that. do this for you and we'll make you more profit. You know, they're and don't, don't be weak hearted or, or, or soft hearted. We've got to be you tough must be, it, it, time for these businesses you must to move be, on. Uh, Active, proactive, not just say, yeah, we got this one out, now we're going to raise the rent this much, we got that one. You know, they have to know a little bit about their tenants, about the businesses that are in there. And that it's the culture of the community. The culture of the community, honor that. As a matter of fact, I was instrumental, how odd, on the day after they got the marshal's eviction, at the default judgment, I should say, and then the marshal's eviction, the day after that, the north side of East 7th Street, which 19 East 7th Street is on, was made a landmark by the uh, Landmark Preservation Development, which I work with. I was instrumental in making this building a landmark, which benefits the landlord. I've been instrumental and benefits the in everything in the community. I've been, I'm very active in the community and the block, but I will continue the story with my documentation in a moment. I'd like you to introduce you to... Father Bernard, as we know him, Panchuk, uh, from St. George's Ukrainian Church across the street, which is a landmark in the neighborhood, and LaSalle and, and St. George School, 
father can talk more about that. He's a great supporter of the village scandal and the block and the entire community and neighborhood. Hi, Father. Good evening. What do you think about small businesses and what they're challenged with? I think they should be preserved. Uh, they make up the community. They make up its quaintness. They really do make up New York, which makes this area an attraction to tourists, uh, the fact that we have the small businesses. And they can function very well with the big businesses doing their thing. I still think the, uh, the small businesses have a great role to play. You also know about crime, because you have a capacity uh, as a, a peace officer? I work with the MTA as a chaplain, and uh, uh, when I'm on the train, my very presence uh, uh, often deters uh, something from happening because they might see the badge and they might see the, uh, the cross and they think twice. In the community here, too, I see uh, various things going on, and when I see them, I make the appropriate phone call to the NYPD, our local police department, which is very good. They're very prompt in uh, checking things out. How long have you been part of this East Village community? Uh, it's various periods. Uh, this particular period or hitch has, has been from 204 till now. And I was also stationed here from 1992 uh, to 1996. And then I did uh, other service here as provincial in, from 88 to 92. So on and off, but in this particular capacity right now, uh, As a man of the cloth, do you, how do you see the resolution of this problem, not only for Wendy Barrett's shop, the village scandal, but in general throughout the city? What do you, where do you think the political will comes to change? So, because we all like small businesses. Well, it we has all to like come from the people. people and, uh, I think if the people uh, say something, uh, the community itself, very often the community doesn't know the little people in the houses who trade in these stores or the tourists for that matter, but if they are uh, apprised of the situation and uh, if our leaders uh, are given a message that this is the way we want it, I think they would think twice because they also get elected by these very same people. How do you take care of the Ukrainian community, the shopkeepers uh, in your congregation, for example? Do they come and share with you their yes, they do. pressures they, yeah. and uh, stresses? And those, those that have, uh, many have closed their shops Again, really? uh, I know one wonderful lady who teaches dancing in the school, and she had to close her shop and get another one because of the rental situation. Are you part of any kind of ecumenical groups that maybe say, uh, let's reach a hand out into the community to look for more economically uh, sound paradigms than the ones uh, I'm that not in the polit political part of the ecumenical groups, but I'm part of uh, the ecumenical relations between the churches themselves and work with closely with the churches and other denominations. So those quick cases will come up, but they'll come up via the, uh, the religious aspect, that, right. that being the first aspect. I know Wendy, in talking about hats, has often said Abraham Lincoln, you know, spoke just a block away. And yes. you were talking about that yes, special kind right. of he hat. He became a national candidate speaking on the balcony of Cooper Union. And right. he bought his stovepipe hat in the neighborhood. Before that, he was not nationally known at all. Right. And he had a drink at McSorley's, which had been newly opened at the time. Um, the reason he spoke on the balcony of Cooper Union was because the, he was to speak at uh, the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights, but the waters were choppy that day, and he ended up becoming a national candidate on the balcony just yards from here. Right. So yeah. my, my point was is that Abraham Lincoln spoke here that there's a culture. You're not just buying a hat today. A, a culture of You're justice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What, what about the Ukrainian members of your congregation? I know that New York has been layered with different uh, immigration ways, and it's yes. usually the new immigrants would settle for conditions that the older ones felt they didn't have to settle for. That's quite true. Are, are Ukrainians prospering in this economy because they, quote unquote, stick together? Do you think? Uh, it's a yes and no situation because there are different waves, and you have to look at those different waves. Uh, the first wave. Uh, um, before World War I. Uh, those people are now deceased, but they set the foundations. My parents are from that particular way, but they went to Chicago because that's where people from our village settled. Uh, the, uh, Fearful of their uh, you know, future in the, in the next world, that they give inordinate amounts of attention to churches. 
when other things uh, more of, of, of a more practical nature need to be done. True. And the Christians you were mean, always known for helping people who are hungry, who are homeless, like that. But in order to be more effective, it seems if we get religions to work together, like say St. Mark's Church, have you ever wor- worked with them on a like how can or, Wendy what do you think you, you, you spent years in this community where do we get the real miracles change well it starts the change we all want starts within ourselves and of course what we dwell upon what we think about it's very metaphysical but um, St. Mark's has been a hub for community activism for many generations now and I think Father Father Bernard works with uh, the rabbi on 6th Street. Um, mm-hmm. I think we all have to work together regardless of, of religious belief. We can throw that into the mix. That can be part of our passion why we're doing it. But we must all be a part, have a voice in our own community. What yes. do you think about media today? Mainstream and alternative? I mean, do you think that the message that you have is, being, is reaching people about the work that you're doing in the Ukrainian community? It's reaching it through... Uh, EWTN, uh, certain uh, networks that are probably run by the church and are, have a, f- a wide, uh, very wide uh, listenership. But uh, if we would say the normal media, the, the main stations, shall we say, two, four, seven, something, I don't think so. They find it kind of boring, I guess. Uh, but, yes, but, but, because but we're, not, we're, not, we're not sensational. Yeah. We don't do sensational things. We do what has to be done. What do you think has to be done for this economic crisis? We still I mean, we've got businesses shutting down. Our culture is disappearing. Well, we also we have, have all McDonald's and Walmart. This, is, this has happened in my community. The uh, parishioners, uh, uh, it's, it's showed up in the collection because uh, they're not giving as much because they're uh, giving a lot of their money to support their kids who've lost their jobs. Right. Uh, and are, 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 will you lose their homes and so forth. So uh, what few pennies they've had, they've actually uh, pushed it in that direction. Uh, so what, was the disaster with the 501c3s affecting the Ukrainian community? You know, when there were all those uh, charities that lost money that weren't able to fund... I believe the, uh, those that uh, were uh, funded by, say, the Ukrainian Museum, which is uh, a community affair on uh, 6th Street. They were uh, affected? I, I would believe they would have been affected. We are not, uh, the church is in tax, but it doesn't get any help either. Right. And we have schools to run. I have two. Uh, high- so, Jessica, I know you work here at the Scandal, Village Scandal. Uh, how did you get on the, the Marie Claire magazine? Uh, well, I attended a Fashion Week show during Fashion Week, um, and they stopped me. Uh, They liked my outfit, and especially stopped me because of the Village Scandal beret I was wearing, which is my favorite beret um, that I own, and wanted to take a picture of me, and I said, absolutely. I had no idea uh, afterwards that it was Marie Claire that was asking to take the picture. Um, I also then later found out, um, I went online, that it was on the cover of Marie Claire Online for, as you could see, the article was, where did you get that style during Fashion Week? And um, highlighted the village scandal um, and myself as well. And only 30 other people were asked uh, to participate as I was flipping through. During Fashion Week and all the fashion shows, only 30 other people who were all models or fashion bloggers were um, part of this. So I think it really tells the story of One, how beautiful the items are here at the Village Scandal and how they stand out. Um, But two, how, uh, well, more on a personal note, how this Village Scandal, um, this place has meant so much to me. And I know that is uh, that is the fact with so many people here. Uh, It's just devastating to think that something as wonderful as the Village Scandal could be taken away from myself and from so many people. It's really a staple in this community. Uh, So. Um, and you work here? Oh uh, yes, I do. Mm-hmm. So, are you a professional model? Oh, also? absolutely not. No, no. no. But I, uh, I well, do model the Village Scandal hats as much as I can. Uh huh. And I know you do other things mm-hmm. than work here. What's that? I'm actually in environmental finance. So, um, the hats at night and environmental mm-hmm. finance during the day. We're all, uh, all the people that work here really come from diverse backgrounds. Just to add 
to the the interesting element that is the village scandal. And so you appreciate it because it's a place where you can meet and talk to people and share ideas, like the the green projects that you're interested you in. You meet so many wonderful people here and so many interesting stories. Uh, I've never, quite honestly, worked retail in my life, uh, and this is far from what I thought I'd be doing. But I love it that much that I'm excited every day when I come to work to meet the people um, that come into the store to show them a beautiful hat that'll make them happy and I even get um, email and letters just saying how happy they and how much they enjoy the experience of coming to the store. Do you have other shops in the East Village that you really particularly like and are being threatened by the hard economic times? Unfortunately, I, I think that is the case. Uh, around this community. I, I don't know specifically, but uh, certainly um, I know that is happening. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, Wendy, can you tell me about this picture? Yes, I can. On March 29th and 30th of 2011 this year, I was on Live with Joey Reynolds all night, which airs five nights a week from midnight to 2 a.m. on the NBC station entertainment channel and it went so well on Thursday the 29th they rerun it the 30th and why do you think it was so compelling or, or why did people like it is it because there's a lot of others like you uh, women well, in unique business because you went to DC for that yes um, well his show is is rather divergent he has on singers he has on he had on the granddaughter of uh, uh, I believe it was Louis Armstrong. I mean, it, it's diver divergent guests over the two hours. But I brought in at that time, the title was, Is it Easter Anymore Without Easter Hats? And I brought in a lot of hats for the panel, including Joey Reynolds. And um, oh. they were all trying them on, and they loved them. It, it makes people very happy to try on hats and accessories. And I talked about how we make them on a wooden block, how they're pieces of art made out of love. Uh, all one of a kind. Many of them are completely handmade here in the store. And um, they seem to be intrigued by that. And their, their listeners seem to be intrigued by it as well. And they were quite beautiful. And uh, also my good friend Christine Eversole, who was active in 9-11 Truth, she yes. heard you on that show and she decided to go on it just because... That's what the producer told me. Yeah. That they, uh, a famous Broadway actress. Right. And... Um, I understood it was Christine. Yeah. Yes. Decided to go on the show. They've been trying to book her, and she wouldn't do it until she saw our segment. And that is what their uh, Fiona, the producer, told me. So how can we keep the village scandal still happening in New York and other businesses like you well, that are making the culture so I need, interesting? In my case, I need everyone to write to the landlord management firm, which I'll get into at the end of the program, we'll give that address, if, everyone, if your viewers would be so kind, because of my extreme legal situation I'm in. It isn't just in a trial. I'm in eviction status. I need to get it back in the trial court so I can show proof that I paid all this money that I was never given credit for from 2004, and for which I've been evicted for every month. But in general... Uh, I know the uh, organic bakery on St. Mark's, a 30-year resident that I believe I might have touched on before, had a terrible situation with his landlord after 30 years in business. I could mention many, many others. We need some kind of guidelines that have come up before the city council in previous years for small businesses, for red caps. For instance, we just lost Mingala, the wonderful Burmese restaurant, 23 7th, two doors away. And I went to many meetings with she and her landlord re-signing a lease. They wanted to triple the rent on her. Now, that is a small neighborhood institution. People still come by the scandal, village scandal, and say, what the heck ever happened to them? We've come in from Atlanta. We've come in from New Jersey. What happened? The food was so exceptional. So we've lost a bit of flavor in the neighborhood. And um, it was tragic to see her gone and uh, generally these small businesses are replaced by big box stores or people that have several stores Los Angeles you know all over the country they have deep pockets but they're not part of the neighborhood flavor 
Mm. When I was moved in here 16 years ago, there were so many artisans making their sandals, making their hats, making their shoes, leather goods, little little uh, little tiny things, jewelry, in their shops and selling them. The rents were reasonable. They were just, you know, it was like visiting a, a, a cafe almost. You felt welcomed. You felt loved. They knew you. They knew what you'd love. They'd make something for you in particular. Or if something came in you you liked, such as we do at the Scandal, they call you. They knew your pet's name. Your pets were welcome. As we keep dog bones, they kept, you know, treats for, for animals. And uh, dogs, I guess. Um, and it was really, it was another world. We don't want to be in a sterile environment in the East Village. It's the last bastion of creativity left in the city, so these, commercially. These, so you're saying these deceptive commercial practices, particularly when uh, landlords and tenants are separated through management companies, is yes, what's causing the demise huge, of the culture it's of New a York huge City? divide, because the landlords are not aware of what the management company is doing. They report bottom line figures, and if they can evict uh, tenants in illegal ways, it doesn't matter. Uh, they get them out any way they can. Sometimes they buy them out. It's worth it to buy them out with, with rent controlled and some stabilized uh, units. And they just want to raise the revenues because unfortunately the landlords now, where you used to have um, cases where, let's say you had a restaurant or I had this store in this building. When it came up for sale, do you know how many people up until the 19, early 90s would buy the building, they could afford it. But the prices have skyrocketed so high in the multi-multi-millions that they're bought by investors. Sometimes the investors, I see these, these addresses on buildings they, they're, they're renovating in you know, Wisconsin, uh, Toronto. They're bought by investors. It's part of an investment package. There's no personalness. And if they are an individual landlord, they usually own multi-buildings. The management firm is acting for the landlord legally and is only concerned with bottom line. Does the management com company have the same liability as a landlord? Who has the I most, believe the, think most the most liability is with the landlord, unfortunately, and the landlords need to protect themselves. What do you think landlords should know in New York City? About I think they should on? really know their buildings because you have people living in them as their homes. You have people doing business for generations. You need to know a little bit more than you would about a stock portfolio. You know, uh, you need to know. There should be different rules then. Right? Yes, and I think there need to be, the need. city council needs, needs to uh, engage in uh, some kind of limits on rent renewals to keep the neighborhood businesses in the business. It's not just up for high bid. We lost that wonderful uh, Kiev restaurant on the corner of 2nd and 7th Street that was there 30, 40 years. Because they couldn't pay the rent? No. Uh, they, their lease was up. They upped the rent. They upped the rent first to twenty thousand dollars a month from six, and then it went up higher than that. From six thousand to twenty thousand. Yes. Wow. So of course that's how you get rid of a commercial tenant. You just make the rent something uh, unaffordable. So what's happened since then? There have been at least a dozen, a dozen restaurants in there that have not made it over the last few years, and we lost. I mean, it was a greasy spoon, but it was a fantastic greasy Ukrainian people uh, restaurant they came from all over people come by the store in tears when these places closed down right. we lost the wonderful wonderful owners and love saves the day that right. eclectic shop where they sold things basically they love vintage and just such unique items they run the corner the north corner of 2nd Avenue and 7th Street they were there 30 years same thing happened to them it was the same landlord that owned the other corner and they of course told them same thing you want to resign twenty thirty thousand dollars a month there's no possible way you can keep an individual single store selling at, at reasonable prices interesting objects right at those prices you have to have a Starbucks you have to have uh, someone with very deep pockets and then you get sterility then you get there's no reason to come to the city so how have you battled this personally with your own paperwork? What's really well, going on with your case in the uh, last 10 minutes? First of all, I wanted, wanted to let you know, while I was losing my store legally, in the end of March, 
Did I say I was on yeah. the jury rounds? Okay. Then one of our good customers who's come in quite a bit lately, Jimmy Fallon. And we supply his band, Roots, with their hats. He and his wife are customers and live in the neighborhood. Uh, time out. We were featured. I'm showing this not for commercial reasons, but because we are a staple. We serve the community. We serve the everyone with the same devotion and uh, styling. We actually provided the hat for Legally Blonde, the okay, movie, and the Broadway show. Can you imagine at that time in 2003, it was $26. <laughs> Eva Mendez is a customer of ours and one of our Village Channel newsboys, Colin Farrell. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's Eva Mendez again, Alec McCord, and here's the basketball player Amari Sutramatri. Yes, and he was in our hat down there. I'll show a better picture of it. I was um, invited to the president's dinner. I won a business award in 2006. After 2011, I uh, the dates are very interesting. A business award was offered for the best woman in retailing in downtown Manhattan. I had the most creative approach to retailing. On June 19, 2006, which is almost exactly five years ago, and on June 20, 2006, I was given this award by jo Senator John McCain. This is just a copy, but he did sign it to me, sign his name. I was given it to him, given it in the Senate, and. And on that, that was the day, five years later, they were going to chain up my store, which was six days after I was served the Marshall's eviction. Five years exactly to the day. Now, this is not a, a situation, as I said, I lost by a default judgment because my lawyer didn't show up. I never, ever got to produce any of my cashier's checks that I've not only paid these taxes, I've overpaid. I've overpaid everything. I was waiting for that day on May 4th. It never happened because they got a default judgment against me because my attorney didn't show up on their surprise <laughs> motion on April 26th. As I said before, on April 27th, this building in the north side of this block was named an historic district. My efforts were a large part of that. We have the old Jewish Yiddish theater down the block. This was a Yiddish neighborhood. This was a Polish neighborhood. George Gershwin was the roller skating champ of East 7th Street. He grew up right around the block. They lived in, in residences all over this neighborhood. But in, and in, Wendy Barrett at the Village Scandal yes. is also an icon of the East Village. So but it, when people come here, they sort of participate. In yes, it because it's a culture. It's not yeah. just a shop. It's not just a shop. It's about, yes, we do allow dogs. Why don't we give them a bone? You see the little treats? So do you want people to help you by writing or Yes, contacting? I would like you to write and call A.J. Clark, attention Steve Kaplan, and attention Andrew Clark, and urge them to withdraw the Marshall's eviction. Let me get back into the trial part of the court and show all my cancel cashier's checks for all the rent they're claiming on this petition that I owe. I have paid it all. If I don't get back into the trial court, I will have lost simply because my attorney didn't show up and I will have never have gotten my evidence before the court, before anybody. This money that I've paid that is close to $100,000 will be forever gone. My employees will be without a job. We'll be chained out of our business. We will lose all the merchandise in the store, all our wonderful customers. And all you're asking for is due process. Right? You want your day in court. I want you my day in court. to present after, your evidence and after your cashier's checks. Exactly. And the, the paper, you know, never got to your lawyer. My lawyer was never served. He said properly. He never had notice. Whatever happened, happened. He never had notice. It was the first time he never showed up in court. This is seven, a seven-year-old case. Seven, seven years of cases brought against me every month for these same taxes. Every month, this was my chance on May 4th. On April 27th, my lawyer didn't show up for a surprise hearing. 
because he didn't have notice and I lost by default. If I had lost in the trial car, I would have been looking for another space. I would have been preparing. I never even thought of looking for another space because I, I knew I'd, I'd win. How about the landlord? Does he know? I don't Dr. know how Mark? much the landlord knows. I've written him a letter, Should you a want heartfelt letter. Today? I want my viewers. I hope he doesn't mind, but I know he's a man of high ethics, and I know he would not want this done in his name. As okay, so viewers, if you write to Dr. Mark Raymer, write a very nice note and just say... Same uh, in thing. the spirit of, give, of the culture of New York City, just allow for de due process and equal protection. Give me a chance to show give, yeah. my proof in court that I've paid him. Actually, i paid the landlord the taxes. A.J. Clark just collected them. And um, I'd like a chance to prove to him and to prove in court I paid them. And then we can go for there. If, if I lose for any reason, I'll lose on the merits of the case. But I won't lose because my lawyer didn't show up in court. And after seven years of being evicted, I liken it to a... The evictions were the uh, gun, and the ammunition was the civil court. And that's why I ended up paying more than what the taxes would do, because I was frightened I would be put out of business by A.J. Clark, who kept evicting me every month. I was trying to satisfy the problem by paying them and paying them and paying them and paying them and having meetings with them. And they would say, yes, Wendy, we will sign a settlement an agreement, I'll give you credit for all the taxes you paid, you will never be sued again for these taxes, we will give you full credit. Now in, in meetings with Steve Kaplan, the building manager, and my cousin, Gail Bressler, who is in real estate for 35 years in a very high and professional capacity, and understands these matters well, Steve Kaplan did verbally admit to receiving all these payments. However, in every commercial lease, there's a paragraph that says anything said verbally cannot be relied on. And he knows that well. So then we would go back in and he would not, you know, he would not put it in writing. Uh, and that is in every commercial lease. That needs to be changed too. Uh, particularly when you make verbal assurances over a seven year period, several times a month. You're talking about a thousand times. Um, the court should protect the commercial tenants to keep New York an interesting city under the leases. There's just too much to lose. I just wanted to show the block president is behind me 100%, and she said uh, she has been the block president for more than 25 years, and she's seen it undergo gentrification, but she's never known one involving a business so important to our community, nor has she ever known a case where they use these kind of ta uh, tactics, these tormenting, and I consider them really torturous tactics, of being evicted every month. She also says, I will support any Action Community Board 3 to get her reinstated if, if Wendy should be put out of business. She will try to get me reinstated. And also, Scott Stringer's office is aware of this case and working on it. Actually, I know Scott Stringer quite well because I was involved, or I did know him quite well. I haven't seen him in many years, unfortunately. But I was a partner in the Yellow Rose restaurant on Amsterdam Avenue between 80th and 81st Street. That's where he got his start before he ran for assembly person. Uh, he met there, and we became quite friendly. And I've always admired his uh, what he stands for and what he tries to do. I. I support him wholeheartedly. It's been difficult to reach him, but Scott, if you hear me, Wendy, remember the, the yellow rose, and in, in, up until the mid-90s, um, he was still coming there all the time, and uh, I'm thrilled he is borough president. We couldn't have a better one, but I know he is very interested in keeping small business alive. I have, in all the businesses I've had since I've been out of school, employed hundreds and hundreds of people not just at the village scandal. I have uh, yeah, made, you're, you're a legend. made you're, this you're, a part you're, of my life. I need your support, Scott. Um, also, I have a wonderful letter from, of course, the owner of McSorley's. And, um, you know, he says uh, that uh, he supports me wholeheartedly, that um, McSorley, it's a landmark, of course, everyone knows that, that I put in lighting on the street. Before I came, there was no lighting. The safety of the entire block has changed. He says I'm the best commercial tenant the landlords could ever have, not just in caring for the building, but I've paid my 
attacked yeah, as so I said right as well. And evicting Wendy would prove a tremendous loss for his business and your building and the entire neighborhood. And uh, the harm that it would do me, of course, I would be in bankruptcy. I'd have no source of income. I could be homeless and I'd lose my home. Now, I did, uh, I don't know if I mentioned previously or not, but I did uh, take out a uh, $10,000 personal loan. There's a letter from Father Bernard that he wrote. Yeah, the one we just saw, right? So no, and that wasn't it. That oh, was another one. So you really this, is, this is the eviction oh, that was served on um, June tenth upon me. So all those loving letters from the community and, what and I then this nasty thing. I, I do want to sh- I do want to show, show and it was it was it was such an emotional day for everyone in the store. We were crying. It was uh, the coldest thing. They pull up in a Marshall's car and hand it to you open-faced. Of course, my customers always saw all my eviction notices. I want to point something out here in the papers that does show that A.J. Clark, and I appeal to them, I appeal to the landlord. Here's the letter I received. I got an $8, a $10,000 personal loan, and it was written out, the check to A.J. Clark for taxes. Here's something they sent me back my rent saying they couldn't accept it because I owed $88,000. This is the taxes they're referring to. But I want to show on this petition that we're in on this latest eviction, which began on May 5th, I want to show a little recent history of what has happened here. Uh, uh, On this latest case, on March 19th, 2010, they said I owed... $67,000.05. $67,000.05. Wrote on here on 4110, legal action dismissed. This is Steve Kaplan of A.J. Clark. Then a letter from Steve Kaplan, April 21st, 2010. He says in taxes, I only owe $5,994, uh, no, excuse me, $5,889.64 and two months rent, which they sent back to me. So I only owe $5,000 in taxes, April 21st. Then, May 5th, less than two weeks later, he's back in court. I owe $63,257. they are evicting me for taxes. They've admitted that are not owed, that they admitted that were paid in that letter alone. And along with every other meeting I have with them where they say I don't owe any taxes. And then they sue me again. Now, for instance, my rent bill this month is 97000 532.62, and they're saying $68,000 for 72 in taxes.